I mean, it made the book better, honestly, for Disney to obstruct us because it lit a fire, a journalistic fire under us. We were like, what story do you not want us to tell? What are you hiding from us? Keep on back! I am here with the authors of this incredible book, MCU, The uh, Reign of Marvel Studios, Joanna Robinson, Dave Gonzalez, Gavin Edwards. Thank you all for taking the time to chat with me. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, what a joy to be here. Uh, I said this before we started recording, and I'll say it for the record, too. We have known you for years on Twitter. You are such a delightful presence in the fandom, uh, and I'm just delighted to get to talk to you about this book. Yeah, oh where, where do we go? Where do we go after uh, Twitter finally crashes? Where do we meet people like <laughs> like you guys? That's that's. I'm gonna I'm gonna miss having good Twitter friends that I eventually get to uh, see in person. Oh, likewise. I mean, we'll have to find a way. I like that we're calling it Twitter instead of that other name that we're not going to call it. Um, you can't make me. But... You can't make me do that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Joanna, thank you for saying that. Uh, I've obviously been a fan of all of your work for a while. So it's really fun to finally be able to talk about this book because also this, the book has been, you know, brewing for quite a bit. Um, before we get started into this amazing book that I've just loved, um, I know all of you, obviously, Marvel has been at the top of your mind for years now. Um, so going forward, before we get into the book, um, Joanna, I'll start with you. What's like the MCU or the Marvel character we haven't seen yet in the MCU that you can't wait to see one day? Oh, this is so hard because I think Gavin and I have the same answer. And so it just depends on who you call on first. He gets <laughs> dibs on it. Um, hmm, so, I, I mean, I get dibs. I will say uh, Squirrel Girl during green um they were you know there was in back when it was abc family before it was freeform uh, a tv show she was cast she was supposed to appear it was all happening and then it got canceled by some nefarious powers that be at at abc and so um you know we got close we got so close to live action squirrel girl and i i am really fingers crossed that we will see that someday yeah, Nefarious Powers That Be could be a chapter in your book or your next <laughs> one. <laughs> um, Gavin, I'm going to give you a little time if if jo uh, Joanna took your answer. So Dave, I'm going to come to you next. So what's, what's the character you can't wait to see? Well, I'm a old school Spider-Man Clone Saga fan, and uh, we've really been eating with the, the uh, Into the Multiverse uh, Spider-Man movies, the Miles Morales movies. Uh, so I got Ben Riley, which so it would have been Ben Riley up until this year. But now I've recently discovered that just means I get to champion another OG clone that doesn't get enough love. So I'm, I'm shifting myself to saying we need to have uh, Kane, the first failed clone of Peter Parker, uh, show up uh, in in live action. Basically, I would I I love multiverse, uh, but and I love Dan Slott's Spider Verse that it's all based on. But like this used to be about clones and uh, the Jackal making bunches of clones of spider-man cloning gwen stacy i still think that works maybe that's just like we we're so terrified in pop culture about ai that tom cruise is fighting one in a mission impossible movie where's the clone fear aren't we close to that <laughs> well said but dave are you okay if that happens in the sony marvel universe Yes, I have uh, learned to Kevin Feige like accept all Marvel universes as existing in uh, something that's apparently being time loomed together in Loki season two uh, into one uh, single timeline. So I yeah, I I there were parts there have been parts in my relationship to the Spider-Man movies where I'm like, Sony, just give it back. Just you don't know what you're doing. Just give it back. Uh, but that was also in a time period where I would have told you that uh, Venom as a buddy comedy would not work. And yet here we are, uh, that first movie works really well, redefining the whole character. So I think Sony has some good ideas. Uh, I reserve uh, the right to take that opinion back once Madam Web comes out and Craven hits. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a good idea. Uh, all right, Gavin, what about you? Aside from Squirrel Girl, um, sure. who else no. would you like to see? 
So if we're doing this, like we're in the fantasy land where we don't have to worry about licensing issues. So I'm going back to like the uh, 1980s and like the toy crossovers. I would love to see Micronauts. I would love to see Rom Space Knight. Rom. Uh, nice. You know, like Bill Mantlo, the great Bill Mantlo wrote both of these and they were so much better than they had to be for toy crossovers. And those were like two of the sets of characters that I just like fell in love with that got me into Marvel comic books in the first place. And there is actually something incredibly poignant, it's particularly about Rom, like you know sort of like you know there's a guy trapped in a metal suit it's like if tony stark could never take off the armor and so i think there's a lot of humanity in that that's can fascinating I add, can i add one more answer please this is gonna be my backup next time you get first dibs gavin which is um <laughs> with love and respect to everyone's favorite canadian texan taylor kitsch a, a true gambit a real the real gambit the gambit <laughs> from my childhood that's <laughs> That's something. Does I that really include need. a Channing Tatum gambit, Joanna? Or Channing, is... Channing could have done it, but he's not going to do it at this point. So it's someone else's turn. Give me, give me the raging Cajun. Uh, give, <laughs> give it to me. I want it. I think many agree with you, and we're fortunately we're probably going to see that soon. Gavin, how dare you bring up a character related to toys, given the creative committee and everything else <laughs> <laughs> in your book? <laughs> Uh, my answer is storm i can't wait to see storm obviously it's, uh, mm, yeah. she's coming uh, yeah. i don't think she's done quite properly with re due respect to the previous films and uh, of course um we'll, we'll, we'll see her soon hopefully so well joanna we have to go to the origin story um but we don't have to go way back i've, I've been reading up on and, and watching your interviews i know a little bit of how this book got started but what i'd actually like to hear from you is when you decided to try to start writing this book what was your goal what was the big picture goal that you um envisioned to get started yeah the the reader i constantly had in mind that i was really scared of and i don't know if that's gavin you'll have to tell me if that's a common thing to think about when you write a book but <laughs> the reader i was scared about was someone like you like the marvel fan who knows so much who who knows like maybe too much and would we be able to tell a story that would surprise and intrigue uh and delight that reader um i got a chance sort of part of as you know part of the genesis of the book is this marvel cover story i got to write for vanity fair and the thing with magazine writing is that you just have such limited space and oftentimes as you're writing those stories the space shrinks and shrinks as like you know <laughs> some other story grows or you get different ad sales or whatever and you watch your column inches go 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 and you have to slice and slice away and um I felt like, I love that story. I have a lot of fondness for it, but I felt like it cut out um, all the things that might surprise someone who knows anything about the Marvel universe. And so when that story came out and a bunch of Marvel people were like, yeah, we already knew this. I was like, no, I want to surprise people. So yeah, so we wanted, we were inspired and encouraged to dig deeper and try to pull up some stories that people hadn't heard before. And try to make sense of a big chapter of Hollywood history for people maybe who aren't diehard Marvel fans, but are curious about film history and like make sense of a decade plus of filmmaking that, you know, no matter how you feel about Marvel will forever be part of film history, film, future film history curriculum, et cetera. So, yeah. Ironically, you face the same anxieties that Marvel Studios has, right? Appealing to the hardcore fans and yet making it accessible to the to a general yeah. consumer. Um, so Dave, like, what about you? What anxieties did you have? But what also, what excited you about getting to do this book? Uh, the anxieties were very similar to Joanna, which is like, uh, I had been doing a column called Marvelous Dave on a site that's now gone called Latino Review uh, for Rest years. Yeah, that took me through uh, the you know the launch of Iron Man and the uh, Phase One stuff of MCU, and then on to Phase Two, and uh, because of that, that those were always sort of like uh, rambling clouds of random thoughts. So I was aware uh, how intense Marvel fans can be, and <laughs> especially when you're trying to tell them that despite their feelings, they're wrong about something. Uh, so I was definitely worried about that as we. Uh, sort of progressed into actually assembling the text and outlining what the book was going to be. Uh, I think it's really interesting to see how the Marvel Cinematic Universe has changed how people can absorb story in cinema. 
Um, maybe not so much on Disney Plus because those are sort of like half TV shows, half you know mini series. But um, the idea that you could have these interconnected universes and um, they could all be leading to a major story that maybe won't come for ten years, but where. Uh, they're successful enough that we're going to eventually get there. And then there started to become this momentum where even people who weren't into the characters originally were like, oh, yeah, well, let's, you know, go to AMC and watch 24 Marvel movies back to back before the new one comes out. And I'm like, you guys are crazy, but I'm so happy we've uh, found like a niche for that where it's like I could watch an Avengers movie with my grandma and she's like, you know, seeing visuals that weren't possible when she was going to the theaters. Uh, and then also little kids are learning about interconnected storytelling and finding their favorite characters that they could then follow into more stories. I think that's probably the benefit of uh, this IP being turned into a franchise. I also think now we're running into a problem, especially towards the end of phase four and with phase five where, uh, We've become so used to this is how the franchise runs that they're going to have trouble ending things in any sort of like satisfying way. Uh, it's one of the benefits of like having Marvel IP to work off of is you have decades of comic book runs that have dealt with this problem. So I think they're going to find their way around it. Uh, but sort of like uh, a lot of the phase four films had post credit scenes where I'm like, I'm never going to see that guy again. <laughs> Am I going to see Hercules fight Thor? Probably never. Harry you know. Styles? Are you ever coming back to the MCU? Harry I Styles and it. Pip? Uh, <laughs> probably not going to see those guys again. So um, uh, the the going beyond what our book covers, which I think covers that first period of sort of like training everybody to be part of the culture, to go see movies, training the world to go see these movies, um, has sort of hit a, another hitch where people are like, you know, I want to see the new project, but I don't want to have to have watched, you know, another 24 movies. And so that perception being out there, I think, is a little bit of a hangover from the high that was Infinity War and Endgame. The, like, proof of concept uh, that really uh, has thus far been the peak of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, well said. Uh, although I, I think the MCU is going to outlive us all. So <laughs> we may see <laughs> some ver version of it in the future, um, depending on what the afterlife looks like. Um, Peter Parker has yeah. always been my age. There's always a version of Peter Parker that's my age, even as I'm getting older and older. So <laughs> I, I think we'll be fine with that. I'll have, a, you know, an old man Parker the way there was an old man Logan by the time I get like a couple of decades early, uh, late, like uh, older. It's, it's going to be fine. It's going to adapt right. to me. <laughs> that's right you know you're getting older depending on the, the comic characters you start really associating and relating with yeah exactly <laughs> and how that evolves now gavin uh you're you're a writing veteran you have uh quite a few books um give me the title of your recent samuel l jackson book well it's a samuel l jackson book so you've got to call it bad motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> i appreciate that so you joined this process um and and for you like what was the part that that really made you excited about, hey, I, I want to join this team. I want to assemble um, right. and, and put out this book. So I you know, like have been a long uh, term fan like of Marvel Comics like and the MCU. And I'd actually gone through like sort of several waves of the MCU, like the first set of movies, like phase one, basically. I'm like, they made them into movies. I'm excited. And then like maybe I might have stopped after the Avengers, but like I had a kid who like, came of age and got excited. And then like maybe I would have stopped when they aged out of it, but I had a younger kid who got excited. And so, you know, like I felt like I had sort of like uh, just like for decades, like been bathing in, uh, you know, this sort of like love of Marvel even longer than I had ever personally planned to. And so when I sort of like first talked with like Joanna and Dave and like discovered just that they had assembled this unbelievable like sort of like treasure trove of the uh, material like you know I was not it was not my beat but it was something I had read a lot about I was enthusiastic about and I could tell just as a reader there is stuff here that like nobody else ever had and I could see you know sort of like the deep dives they had done and Joanna had interviewed like dozens and dozens of people and gotten like people I never would have imagined to talk so I was just thrilled with, like great let's take this mountain of material and sort of like, you know, uh, put it in like sort of like an ice cream sundae dish. But, you know, you sort of like have to sort of find a way to craft like that so that like it's actually digestible. Mm. Yeah, I think you all did that. It, it, I was just telling, this was pre-recording, I was just telling Dave, it's such an incredible amount of information and an expanded timeline. And to 
put that into a book, I, I, I think it must have been a Herculean task. Um, and you all you all accomplished that. So Joanna, you know, Gavin just talked about all the interviews that you did and access to to those that he didn't think you'd be able to get. Of course, a juicy nugget early, which I've heard you talk about, um, is that at first Disney wasn't going to interfere. And then you found out they weren't so thrilled about it you know, a little bit more quietly. Do you get a sense of what changed and why, uh, what motivated them to kind of change that stance? And how did that make your job more difficult? Yeah, I think there's a couple things involved. And and what's really funny, I actually haven't talked much about this, but what's really funny is like right at the end, there was a sort of changing of the guard at, at in Disney PR. And right at the end, I connected with someone who said, oh, I don't think we need to obstruct anything and i was like well a little late now it's a little late <laughs> now for you to have that change of heart doesn't help me now um but uh when we started i think they were you know in, in the time between when we started in 2019 and our pub date now marvel put out their own um version of their history this sort of sanitized disneyfied um it's a beautiful book it's a great sort of collector's item for people who who like Marvel, but they don't pay me to sell their book, but I just want to give it its due, like some great journalists work on that, but it is their narrative. And um, I believe what's true is that when we started, they were unsure whether or not they were even going to put out that book. Um, there had been a different version of that book um, that had more of the juicy stories and the powers that be at Disney read it and were like, well, we can't put this out. So I think they were in a period where there was a question mark as to whether or not they were even going to put out their own book. And once they decided they were, then what is their motivation for us to sort of put out something competing that is even, you know, goes even a little deeper than their own book does because we can tell the stories that, you know, those journalists unfortunately had to cut out of their version of the book. And so I... I think that's part of what shifted is just sort of their own internal publishing plans. And then just in general, you know, they don't, they don't like people. A, I don't think they want to be on record saying no to us directly. So they sort of did it through back channels. I think that's part of it too, you know, where they're sort of like, sure. Okay. Whatever, do what you want. And then going around and telling people's publicists not to talk to us. So I think, um, something that's true. I, I this really does sound like I'm just, selling our own book but i guess that's what we're here for but that's um, what we're here for yeah. <laughs> um i think what's true is that it made it i mean it made the book better honestly for disney to obstruct us because it lit a fire a journalistic fire under us we were like what story do you not want us to tell what are you hiding from us and all three of us on on this call with you are marvel fans so we're definitely not here to bash marvel or sort of kick dirt on it and that's certainly not what the book is but we just feel like the fans and the non-fans and everyone in between you know deserves to know who's in control of the stories that you're you know watching over and over and over again who gets to decide who are you know the next generation is growing up thinking of as a hero i think that's like a really core concept of the book is like who are the people pulling the strings on these narratives that have such a massive influence on the kids that they help bring up from time to time you know so um yeah that's that's the disney obstruction story <laughs> <laughs> now was there anybody that you really wanted to talk to that unfortunately even using you know your journalistic wiles weren't weren't able to get in front of michael jackson <laughs> <laughs> why did you want to play professor x so badly we held a seance but we couldn't use any of the quotes it was a background <laughs> seance um who were what that that's tough for me because it obviously would have been great to spend uh more time with some of the big stars that were basically done with marvel studios by the time we got around to them um when it came time to get back around to scarlett johansson she was in the middle of a, a contract dispute with disney at the time so probably it wasn't going to happen uh chris evans has been very very uh careful about where he talks about Captain America and his experience with Marvel because he still says he's done. That could just be really good PR because he's coming back in Secret Wars, but you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, but also for me, um, once I was able to realize that I those are what I thought I wanted and they're big names that would be you know great to have like the way that Joanna got to sit in Kevin Feige's office for hours and interview him. It would have been great to have that 
with some big names, but they weren't the people with the most interesting uh, stories. Um, I love uh, <laughs> Joanna did uh, the live share of the interviews, basically all the interviews. And uh, but uh, there were certain uh, interview subjects that I would prep her on with like research. It's like, here's what we need to get. Here's stuff. And every time there was like a visual effects artist or a motion capture artist, I'd be like, here's stuff that I would just like you to ask them so that they could talk about it for a little bit. And like, the it's Moma probably dust? not going to make it. <laughs> Good old move a dust. Yeah. Uh, but being interested in like those types of stories um, and hearing how, you know, like the, the Hulk is a sphere and uh, Abomination is a cube and like how that makes their mo their mo motion and their motion capture uh, different. Uh, so I always enjoyed those stories. It was more like uh, discovering that what I wanted from the content was different from maybe like some of the A-listers I would have maybe picked. And the other good thing about the A-listers is uh, they really have to promote their work when it comes out. So there's tons of material from them if we needed it. Uh, but like the juiciest stuff was not coming from anybody that is walking a red carpet. Well, speaking of somebody who's not walking a red carpet, um, if there's a shadowy figure in Perfect the story, transition. <laughs> <laughs> it's Ike Perlmutter. Uh, so I, uh, I think in the book, it's well said, like, there aren't even many pictures of him. People don't want to talk about him on record. Um, I'll leave it to anybody to answer this, but you know, what did you learn about him that was really surprising um, from a story perspective or a background perspective? And how much would you say his impact still lingers in the MCU? I give him a lot of credit for rescuing Marvel from bankruptcy and for knowing that Avi Arad was the right person to develop the IP uh, into movies and especially the cartoons in the 90s. Uh, that was a great direction uh, he might Avi might not have be that been the best story guy, but one of the benefits of Avi in that particular time in uh, Marvel's media multimedia history was uh, he wouldn't really say no to things. That like, people would be like, "What about like a Ghost Rider samurai movie?" He's like, "I love Ghost Rider, try it." <laughs> um, so that team was who Marvel needed then, uh, and then Ike uh, built his you know personal fortune uh by being a very good businessman so i'd ever want to like side talk is a uh, business acumen that is definitely uh smarter than me in that case uh but once it had to become a creativity forward uh enterprise um uh, once marvel studios came about and they were like we're gonna it was attractive to him because they're going to own, you're not going to be uh, taking a percentage from another studio's profits. You're going to get all of it. Uh, but he still has never really been a story first guy. He's always been a dollars and cents guy. So even when he was in charge of the comic book arm, uh, you could read Sean Howe's Marvel, uh, the untold story. And there's a bunch of things where just they're, they're, he's always about the business and he's always like, if it's not profitable, why are we doing it? And then there's always a group of creatives below him that are getting paychecks from him that is like, please listen, that is not how this works. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, he's a controversial figure. Uh, only got more controversial as time went on and I learned more about him. The period of time that Trump was in office and uh, Ike was still at the head of Marvel, I did not buy Marvel Comics those four years. Uh, because of he was sort of helping shadow run the VA in a way we don't really get into. But if you want to Google it, it's some messed up stuff. So uh, I don't think he has much of an impact now. Um, he at, at at the end of our book and luckily before the book was published, uh, he sort of got forced out of his uh, last controlling position um, and some other lawsuits uh, hit him simultaneously. So I think everybody, uh, I think it was about time for him to step back and enjoy his millions and not have to feel like he has to micromanage things that nobody wants him to micromanage. So I hope he's having a fantastic retirement, but also he leaves Marvel Studios alone. <laughs> I mean, I was stunned at just how many stories there were of his extreme thriftiness that like, it felt like you know, every week, uh, like we'd find another one that, you know, sort of like he wants journalists to have only one can of soda, the uh, uh, junket, 
you know, he doesn't uh, like allow people to buy Kleenex. He says, use the napkin from your lunch. She's not like, you know, there's chairs in the office that are falling apart. And we had so many of them that eventually I'm like, well, we just have to put them all together. There's like a mega mix of, you know, sort of like Ike Perlmutter being cheap, uh, which I think, you know, it's a tribute to the people who were working at Marvel that, you know, like what's on the screen, like didn't reflect, you know, sort of like the penury that they were dealing with. Yeah, the purple pens. It was just a story <laughs> I couldn't believe. <laughs> Joanna, if the flip side of it, if there's a protagonist of the story, it has to be Kevin Feige. And so um, Dave obviously talked about you had a chance to sit down with him. And it's it, it's a testament to the current landscape that he's like a celebrity on his, in his own right. So you know a lot about him already, I assume, but what did, was surprising to you or, or just a, a fun nugget that you learned um, while being able to write this book? Well, talking to Kevin uh, is a great experience because he doesn't, he, what I love about Kevin is that he doesn't lie ever, never been caught in a lie. Uh, and you can't say that for every, you know, slick Hollywood personality. And he's not slick. And he's not really like, it's not about him. He doesn't make it the Kevin Feige show ever. He can play the ringmaster at Comic-Con if he needs to, but that's not really sort of where he puts his focus. And so he comes off as really genuine. He's very canny and political. He doesn't burn bridges, but he's not lying his way to the top. And that's just a really refreshing, nice thing about him. I think the most I learned from about Kevin was from the people who've worked around him, like Craig Kyle, who's a longtime friend of Kevin's and a, um, a producer at Marvel was very forthcoming about Kevin's process, mindset, background. That was just a hugely important interview we did that helped unlock things about Kevin that he would never talk about himself. Like Kevin doesn't really want to talk about himself. And I remember when I interviewed him and I came through with, he doesn't give a lot of interviews. And when I interviewed him and I came through with the, this is going to sound self-aggrandizing, but I came through with some biographical details. He's like, you have done your research. He's like, <laughs> where did you learn about that? Um, and so really talking to other people about Kevin is the best way to understand Kevin. So talking to Craig Kyle, talking to David Maisel, who is, a, you know, talked to us also for very generously for hours and hours is a really important figure put together the financial deal that helps launch Marvel studios in the first place is not just a numbers guy is a creative guy promoted Kevin to the top of the studio. And so like, he has a sense of who Kevin is as well. And so all of that really helped me understand Feige better. And I think the key takeaway and Feige himself will say this is that Kevin Feige was not a comic book nerd growing up. That is a mistake a lot of people make. They think, of course, the guy who runs Marvel Studios must have been always keeping his comic books in plastic sleeves, you know, as a kid and stuff like that. And that wasn't, that wasn't his niche. He's a blockbuster guy. He's a movie guy. And so he grew up wanting to become a director. He winds up being a producer instead. And, but he gets to make those films he loved as a kid, those Back to the Future, Richard Donner, Superman, like those kind of fun blockbustery movies through the lens of comic books. And he certainly studied comic books now and could probably beat all of us at Marvel trivia like easily. But that's something he did later in life. And what that meant was that he was able to craft these movies um, in a way that are welcoming to people who aren't didn't grow up on this stuff he's not so inside that he can't see the kind of basic storytelling beats you need to put out there in order to draw in audiences who are wildly unfamiliar with this world he's like well we'll get them with character we'll get them with story we'll get them with you know this that and the other thing basic movie tell movie movie storytelling basics that i think a lot of comic book superhero movies lose sight of because they think well, you're familiar either A, you're familiar already familiar with the property, or B, you just want to see like Smash Pow Wallop. And there's nothing wrong with Smash Pow Wallop. I'm a big fan of, you know, the Adam West Batman, et cetera. But um get, get you gotta get that heart in there too. There have to be characters you care about before we see them get smashed in the face with a CGI creation or something like that. So yeah, Feige, what a fascinating figure, honestly. I love the story Craig uh, told you about like being on vacation in Palm Springs and there's like Feige like in the shade with a stack of graphic novels, you know, like yeah. not doing vacation-y things. He's just like doing his Marvel reading homework. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. How would history have been different if Kevin Feige wasn't a ginger and didn't have to sit in the shade? <laughs> <time? laughs> uh, we, we, the hats wouldn't be a thing, probably. <laughs> probably. Uh, oh, no, the I trademark hats. Status, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Joanna, I, th- I really like that point that he's not, a, he wasn't a comic book geek. And there is that quote um, where, Somebody says like it, this couldn't have happened if he was a comic book geek. It's to, it's to his credit, and I really liked the Lauren Schuler Donner quote that he learned from her, and it, he approached things with maybe a little more empathy and intuition. Yeah. Um, it gives a lot of insight into who he is. But is that still the case now? Because he now is he in too deep, and does he still have that you know story focus um, given what Marvel has turned into? <laughs> I I think he still has the story focus, but it's like uh, watching a juggling show and you thought it was going to maybe end an hour ago, but it, somebody keeps throwing balls to the <laughs> juggler. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, what well, once was your talent, I'm now afraid for you. Yeah. Like, are you yeah. okay? Yeah. It's cert- you should have at least gotten a water break by this point, I would think. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, it's hard it's hard to uh replicate what kevin feige does and the um amount of attention he used to be able to give projects because it was like marvel's next thing uh was you know all writing on this uh now it's all writing on like 40 different things that are either in production announced way too early because uh they wanted to get more subscribers to disney plus uh or just like uh, a sort of thing where they go so far down the road of something like secret invasion that they can't just be like uh maybe we made a mistake with this one they're like nope we just gotta pump another hundred million dollars into it and uh get it out there so there there are new obstacles uh that have come with trying to scale up marvel studios and simultaneously scale up a person uh which doesn't work that way uh you can't just make more hours in the day for kevin feige to have his process uh so i think we're seeing some of that now and we'll i i imagine uh, we'll see the benefits of it on the other side as Marvel slows its production schedule. Yeah, this is why we don't fear cloning, Dave, because we want to clone Kevin Feige. <laughs> yes, is, is yes. It... <laughs> oh my God, maybe Kane's a Kevin Feige clone. <laughs> <laughs> well, so to that point, this is like the Kevin Feige support group. Like, do you all get a sense? How much does Kevin Feige have left in this role? Uh, and he has this, I got to fix it focus. Um, how long ever, are we? Uh, it's gonna. You ever hear here. something you said come out of someone else's mouth, and you're like, "Yeah, if I can fix it, it's going to be the nation." Sorry. The the, okay. the dedicated well, legacy of Wreck It Ralph. <laughs> yeah. <exactly. laughs> you know, we did have some uh, moments of paranoia six months ago. What if Kevin Feige gets fired before the book comes out? <laughs> so, you know, it's like, no, it's going to be okay. You know, they're going to let him fix it. So. I mean, I can't imagine Kevin Feige having another act in Hollywood after Marvel, right? Like, it, I assume that like this is his job as far like as long as he can take it. Yeah. The only I th- thing I could think, the only thing I asked because when Bob Iger stepped down the first time, and there was all this, who who's going to take over Bob Iger? I was convinced at the time because Feige was sort of top of the world, king of the world, that like maybe Kevin Feige would take over that. But talking to people inside of Disney around that time, they're like, oh, he doesn't really want to do he doesn't want to do that. That would take him away from what he likes to do, which is make movies. So he doesn't really want to do that. So the actually the only thing I could see him doing, and I I don't think Disney would let him do this. The only thing I could see him doing is possibly taking over Lucasfilm. Wow. Again, I don't think that would ever happen, but he love star wars he was not a marvel kid growing up but he was a star wars kid growing up and so he loves star wars so you know i you know i think favreau and filoni and a number of other people are much more likely to take over when kathy kennedy is done like you know uh, bearing the bread of the responsibility for everything happening at lucasfilm um <laughs> but that's the it's like a it's a lateral move to a certain degree uh maybe even a step down given their sort of um, respected positions in the culture right now but i could see it as him sort of chasing a passion and still getting to like be the quasi filmmaker that he gets to be at, at marvel yeah trying to fix that is the yeah. next, is the next Why you fix it star wars i, would, <laughs> I, I wouldn't there's, hate it there's a draft of what he how he would start fixing it somewhere out there that we're never going to see i know so. michael waldron call us where is it <laughs> now i'm a huge fan of marvel but my focus 
um, is, is diversity in entertainment and, and Marvel has come a long way. And I really appreciate it in the book, the par parts where you addressed how challenging it was um, to get Black Widow made or to have Scarlett Johansson's character be not a, you know, a stereotype. And of course, Black Panther is, is a huge pinnacle uh, of that um, fight. So uh, how, how much did Black Panther change the way Marvel Studios um, proceeded to take the next few projects and, and look at the stories beyond? I think, so what really, I was gonna say hurt my, hurts my feelings, maybe that's too personal. What I think is a shame and what we really wanted to make sure was not the message of the book is that just as Marvel starts to ramp up the diversity of heroes, um, that's when sort of the franchise starts to falter at the same time. And I really, we really wanted to make sure that the messaging of the book isn't Ike Perlmutter was right all along. You need white, white guys named Chris in order to anchor this franchise in order for it to be a success. So that's why. And I, and I, cause I really don't think they're related. I really think it has so much more to do with the quantity of projects they're asked to do COVID a number of other things. Like there's so many factors in the, in the soup. I don't think it's that, you know, all of a sudden we get the Eternals or Shang-Chi or a number of other things or Miss Marvel, et cetera. Um, but I think Black Panther, and we, you know, we definitely talk about it in the book, is such an interesting crossroads for this question of control that we're tracking all through the book. Because if you go back to the beginning of the writer's program, something we cover at Marvel that not a lot of people know about, Black Panther was sort of top of mind for Marvel way back then, the beginning of the writer's project. This is something that they wanted to do for a long time and something that Marvel East Coast, as headed by that shadowy figure Ike Perlmutter, was pushing back against. And finally, it came down to Bob Iger basically having to step in and, and broker this deal and say, no, they're going to make Black Panther and you're going to stop obstructing that. And the fact that both Black Panther and Captain Marvel starring Brie Larson were big smash all of box office hits and Black Panther was just such a pop cultural moment present at the Oscars, all this sort of stuff. Um, really forever served as a confirmation to Kevin Feige and the rest of his team at Marvel that they were right all along that, uh, you know, non white, non male superheroes can not only sell toys, but also movie tickets also get everyone in all demographics interested in the story. Um, I, you know, there will, I, I, I'm feel really lucky that we got to live through the Black Panther uh, debut that year just felt, it felt incredible to be a part of. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't for me, obviously it is for another audience. And so for me to just like, but it was also for me, you know, it wasn't for me, but I was also invited. And, and that was just like really special to be a part of. I think uh, just to completely agree with everything you just said, but uh, just like reminding that if Chadwick Boseman were still alive, yeah. the current Marvel moment would look very different. Like, you Absolutely. know, sort of with, you know, sort of like a Downey and Evans and other people retiring, I think he would have stepped forward to be the face of the MCU. And that was something they were counting on that, you know, for like tragic reasons, like isn't going to happen. Yeah. Also, in that specific time that Black Panther came out, the trust given to Ryan Coogler to make it authentic in his way uh right, coming out of you know phase two which has a lot of people uh trying to jam movies into the marvel cinematic universe that don't, doesn't necessarily feel like you know ant-man probably isn't going to feel like a peyton reed film ever because it had to be reconstructed from an edgar wright film there was this idea that maybe marvel was looking for people to sort of like ride into the ground after joss whedon is just like i'm tired after ultron uh so the fact that they were able to find this young upcoming black director and basically you know in the one of his first meetings he's like you know this is going to be an all black cast right and kevin feige's like yeah that's why we're doing it and then just giving him uh the leeway to go and really uh research in africa and to bring an afrofuturist take into the story and just make it feel authentic from top to bottom uh, even though he's basically adapting a character that shows up in Civil War for an entirely different purpose, uh, was incredibly smart. And him having that leeway in the movie being as successful it was and as pure of a vision as it was is what 
brings directors back to wanting to work with Marvel Studios after a difficult period where there was a lot of behind the scenes strife happening. Yeah, I, just listening to the three of you talk about the like the what ifs, Gavin, the, it, how things would be different and all that. It's it's such a sliding doors moment. Um, and honestly, it makes me a little emotional thinking back, like you said, Joanna, to that time when the first movie came out and had such an impact. Um, before uh, the last question for, uh, that I'd like to ask each of you before I let you go, because I really could keep you for three hours. Um, <laughs> Gavin, I'm going to start with you. In ten years, when the three yep. of you reassemble to write the sequel to this book. What's the title and what's it going to be about? <laughs> uh, you know, it's sort of like uh, we uh, keep coming up with like different euphemisms for like the current Marvel moment. You know, like, are they having a blip? Are they having a wobble? Uh, so I think it's, you know, sort of like it's something like surviving the wobble. Like if we're around in 10 years and like, you know, they uh, we still care uh, that it means that they sort of like they righted the ship and they uh, put it together and you know sort of like i think that means that they also found a way to bring in all of these other characters that they've been keeping in their pocket like what is like the good movie version of the fantastic four that you know like and so you're looking back at you know sort of like the brilliant way in which they sort of took these properties that had not always been handled well and found a way of like folding them into the mcu um, and I would be curious to know like exactly how they pulled that off. Now, Dave, I think you're pretty optimistic, right? That uh, this is a book oh, yeah. and that yeah. it's not. So so in 10 years, what project out? What is, what's the book going to be about? I mean, you still got to sell books. So I think it would be called Battle World, The Secret, War Secret Wars of Marvel Studios. Oh, close to That's mine. That's like the <laughs> geekiest, beautiful answer. I <laughs> love that so much. <laughs> mine was, mine was going to be MCU colon Veterans of the Secret Wars, something Ooh, like that. Like yes. about the other side of the Secret Wars and like. But yeah, Secret Wars actually was one of the titles we tried to get our publisher to go with it at some point, you know. Um, sorry, Dave, what is your what is your very long titled book about? <laughs> uh, it, it's about uh, the basically how this one is about multi, the Infinity Saga sort of going into the multiverse saga. I'm very interested in we were talking about uh, like the way that Kevin Feige's fixing it by reclaiming all these cast members basically before they retire but uh, in a way that also reclaims the stories from uh, 2000 onward hopefully from 1997 onward wesley snipes i'd like to see you in a future mcu movie um but uh that's sort of like like the comic book story secret world uh did for the comic book universe is uh iron man and captain america uh fought at the end of the world and then they woke up on a battle world that was all these different timelines and all these different comic book stories squished into one. Uh, and then they had to basically fight Dr. Doom, who was a god keeping the human torch as the son of the world, uh, to reestablish the new Marvel like soft reboot uh, universe. But just uh, in the next 10 years, we will have lived through that inflection point like we lived through uh, Infinity War and Endgame. And I think that would be a natural beat if it's just about MCU at that point. And in like 10 years, I'm interested in uh, like the legacy of what Disney did uh, that included Marvel Studios. And we cover sort of in the book, uh, oh, in a chapter, uh, No Strings on Me, I think it's called. But it's like Bob Iger's strategy was uh, buy very creative studios, fold them under Disney, let them cook, make little park uh, worlds where you could visit all the characters or build your own lightsaber or something uh, and then flood Disney Plus with a bunch of shows. I am very interested to see which one of those seemed like a good idea in 10 years uh, because it's, uh, they've all had their little wobbles, if you will. Dave, I wish, I don't know if you did, I wish you could have seen Joanna and Gavin's faces as you were too, going through that whole uh, excellent nerdy breakdown. They, I think they it were was loving when he said it. human torch as the earth sun is when <laughs> Gavin and I uh, lost it. Uh, yeah. And my book, uh, our book would be about, um, <laughs> I think, I think where we are right now is such an interesting um, point for the content I really think, and I don't mean to sound like John Landgraf like 10 years ago, that we are on the precipice of some sort of collapse. 
of the content wars of the streaming wars the streaming wars is a, a lot of what has gotten marvel into trouble in the last couple of years and trying to keep up with everything so as those realities if you will collapse back in on each other and we sort of ramp back down production which is the messaging we're hearing from all studio heads you know Zaslav is shuttering things as quickly as he can over there at uh, Discovery Warner Brothers um that I think I'm going to be interested to see what Marvel looks like on the other side of that and also just maybe as a way to look at the larger streaming wars and what it did for storytelling how it how it changed our ideas and and Marvel specifically role in all of that um because with Secret Wars, they have the opportunity for a soft reboot of the MCU, not a hard reboot, but a soft reboot. And that will be a really interesting moment to, I, I'm, you know, Dave has convinced me not to count them out. And, you know, I'm, I'm largely with him on that. But I do think it's going to be a minute before we see Marvel resurgent. I don't think it's right around the corner. I think they need some time to like, regather get their ducks all back in a row and and really figure out their plan going forward so yeah is 10 years enough time though <laughs> maybe we need 20 i don't know I, <laughs> 10 years feels soon is that <laughs> weird to say let let kevin feige stop <laughs> juggling joanna yes. <laughs> <laughs> well stop throwing need... balls at him <laughs> if we need 20 years that means that's uh, perfect for you all to write a trilogy to cap it off. <laughs> our our well, MC Ragnarok. Yeah. yeah that's right. Coming soon. Yeah. That's right. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, really love the book. And it was an incredible undertaking um, that you really stuck the landing. So congratulations. Um, the book, MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios. I can't tell you how many times I said it backwards. Um, <laughs> Not the comes out one. next week. Yeah comes out next week, October 10th, and you all are about to head on a in-person book tour, which you told me was the first time that you will be together. Um, I think Evan said, breathing the same air. Uh, what's the first stop on the book tour? Uh, we're doing a virtual event on Sunday for Book Loft that we're really excited to do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, um, my first in-person is Monday. I think I'm going to see you there in Los Angeles. I will see That's you right. there. Um, and then all together, though, uh, I think is New York Comic Con, is it not? Yeah. yeah. Right? Well, New York Comic Con is the first. Yeah. The Javits. Let's talk about breathing the same air. Maybe through a mask at the Javits Center <laughs> and New York Comic Con. <laughs> we will see. We'll all be together for the first time. So, yeah. That's right. That's a lot of same air to be breathing. Yeah. Um, but mm -hmm. I think there's something appropriate about um, all of you getting together at a Comic Con. So, congratulations. Looking forward to it. And um, hope to speak with you again in 10 years. Okay. Thank you so much. You don't have to wait that long. Thanks, Rob. <laughs>